Welcome to chapter two of AP Biology, where we're gonna cover chemistry concepts. Now we're gonna go more in depth with chemistry than you'll probably see on the AP Bio exam. But when we talk about biology, when we really focus on the essence of what biology is, the cell, life, we have to remember that that cell is entirely composed of atoms that are arranged into molecules, which are arranged into these macromolecules that we have, which eventually become the organelles and the cell itself. So when we discuss a lot of these processes of life further on in the course, we're going to come back and discuss some of these molecular concepts, and I kind of expect you just to know them. It's not so much I'm going to give you a picture of orbitals, but I want you to realize, you know, which uh, at which atom or element is most likely to form the most bonds, you know, and which one's most likely to be polar, so it'll go through the cell membrane, uh, or won't be able to go through the cell membrane, as the case may be. So you need to get these concepts to understand it. So, starting off, we've got matter, the most basic stuff, something that ultimately occupies space, has mass, nothing fancy. Now, when we look at matter, we normally will group that into two kind of groups. We have the elements, which are those fundamental pieces that we can't break down and still keep their characteristics. And we've got those arranged in the periodic table of the elements. We can then start to mix and match, which is critical because it gives us so many more options. When you actually stick together or bond two different elements, you get a compound, and that compound has different characteristics in most cases from the element by itself. And so being able to mix and match a whole bunch of different, you've got 92 elements naturally existing on Earth, so being able to mix and match these, and many of them you can mix and match in different combinations. So you can have carbon monoxide, CO. You can have carbon dioxide, CO2. It's not like just because there's two elements involved that you can only like align them a certain way. That's not necessarily true. So this gives us a ton of different materials, compounds to work with within life. This gives us lots of options to get these different functions and characteristics that we may need to achieve certain tasks as a living organism. Now, next bit, we've got the atom. So let's just go through some of the basics here. When we talk about atoms, that fundamental unit that still keeps its properties, uh, we're going to talk about some numbers just to make sure you're comfortable. We will go over this later in further chapters, uh, so you do need to kind of have this at the back of your mind, even if I don't give you a question directly. But your atomic number is the number of protons. Okay, This is really what determines what element you are. We don't care if you lose an electron or gain one. It doesn't change the actual element you are. It just changes your charge. So this atomic number is the smallest number that you see here. So nitrogens is seven, uh, carbons is six. That's your atomic number. That's what makes you that element. If carbon gained a proton, it would become nitrogen. Now the mass number is more intriguing because this is protons, which I'm gonna write as P pluses. Uh, and it's also going to be adding the neutrons, which I'll write N0 because they have no charge. So this is the stuff that you find smashed together in the nucleus of an atom. And so for this, you'll see this is represented by the top number. Now keep in mind, sometimes you'll see this top number written differently. Like it might say, like for carbon, it's 12.011. Keep in mind that there's multiple ways to combine the protons and neutrons. I, I guess I'm not explaining that great. So keep in mind that when you have an element, there can be different isotopes. What that means is you have the same protons, but you can have different numbers of neutrons. So you might be adding the protons plus six neutrons, we'll just write neutrons, uh, whereas that would ultimately give you carbon 12, right? If we have six protons plus six neutrons, but you could also have where you take six protons and you add seven neutrons to it. We call those isotopes. It's the same element, but it has a different mass because it has a different number of neutrons. And so this means that the mass number can actually fluctuate. So in this case, carbon can have carbon 12, the most common, carbon 13, carbon 14. When we put that number that's on the actual periodic table, which in this case for carbon would end up being 12.011, keep in mind that's an average. So what they do is say, well, most of this is carbon 12, and there's a little bit of these other two, carbon 13 and carbon 14. So they use that little bit of each of these, and when they average it, they get a little bit over 12, because these guys lift up the average just a tiny bit because they're present in really small amounts. And so that's why when you look at a periodic table, you'll see that number that's usually not exactly 12, or exactly 13, or exactly 14. Don't freak out about that. 
but for our purposes, just remember, atomic numbers, protons, mass numbers, protons, and neutrons. We can vary the number of neutrons, which becomes very important later on, because some of these isotopes will be radioactive, and we can use that to help figure out the age of things. So we care a lot about the fact that there are these isotopes that are radioactive. Seems lame, but we do care because of that. All right, that should be good for that. Now, energy, let's go over just the basics. Energy is what allows us to get stuff done. So within our bodies, we're going to use biologically primarily a guy called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We're going to use that as our energy molecule. And so how this works is some of our energy reactions will be exothermic. And that means that they will release energy. So we start out with a high level of energy and we end up with a lower level of energy. So this in-between amount is released and it can be used then, it can be harnessed to do work to allow us to get stuff done biologically. So we can pair it up, what's called energy coupling, we can pair that up with reactions that are endothermic, ones that ultimately are absorbing energy to occur. So they need an input of energy. So if we do some exothermic reactions, we can pair that up with endothermic reactions to allow the endothermic reactions to occur. They wouldn't normally. You know, a rock's not normally going to roll itself up onto the hill. But if I give it energy, I can get it up there. That's essentially how our body works. And energy is going to fundamentally go to a couple concepts. We've got energy levels. So this is going to be something that we'll discuss sometimes with electrons especially, whereas electrons, as they get moved further away from the nucleus, that essentially has stored energy. And as they fall back down to get closer to the nucleus, they release that energy. So when we talk about atoms, they have this ability to store energy just in the location of their electrons as well as release it. We also have where molecules and compounds, they can store energy essentially through bonding, where whenever you break a bond, you have to give it some energy. That's this initial little bump here is where we're breaking the bond, all right? But then when you form a bond, you'll see that you release energy. In some cases, it's just a little bit, so we had to put way more energy in than we got out. But in many cases, we put in a little bit of energy to break bonds, and then when we form the bonds, we get a lot of it out. And so by adjusting who's bonded to who, it's possible to release energy. It's also possible to store energy. But those bonds will play a critical role in figuring out just how much energy is stored in a molecule. You know, something like uh, gasoline has bonds that have a lot of energy stored. They're still way up here at the top energy-wise to start. And so as we shift those bonds and reform them, we can do so into molecules with much less energy at the end and all that energy gets released and that's how your car can drive using you know a gallon of gasoline and it can drive miles and miles despite the fact it's several thousand pounds now valence electrons is going to be the electrons that we have that are on the outermost part the outermost energy level of an atom so those are if you remember back your orbitals those are the s and p orbitals and if you remember your Lewis dot diagrams, this is how we map out how many valence electrons something has. So oxygen has six valence electrons. So it's got two that are kind of paired up. These ones are already fine. And it's got two that are by themselves. This is critical because the number of electrons that you have that are by themselves typically dictates how many bonds you want to form. So oxygen likes to form two bonds because that allows it to pair up each of these electrons in some way by bonding. Because pretty much everybody, for our purposes, uh, with the one exception of hydrogen, which only wants two, but everybody else pretty much wants eight electrons to be stable. And so oxygen only has six. It needs two more somehow for it to be stable, for it to energetically you know, be, be content. And I say content not as a feeling, but just as an energy state. And so they can share electrons to try to get to that eight or if you're hydrogen too, they can also lose or gain electrons. Because if I have just a single electron, oftentimes the fastest way for me to become stable is to get rid of it because now I've got a shell of eight, you know, a full set waiting below that. And so you don't always have to just share. You don't always have to try to be gaining stuff. In many cases, you'll see some guys like sodium here. If it's just got one, its best thing is just get rid of it. And then it's left with a full valence shell underneath. Now, Bonds. Ionic bonds, we're not going to discuss these as much biologically. We'll discuss ions, which are charged atoms. So that'd be like a Ca2+, plus. that'd be an ion. We'll discuss those a lot, but because most ionic bonds will dissociate water and break apart into their ions, 
and because life is almost always a lot of water it's really not as useful to us so we'll have ion stuff that previously was ionically bonded but in our bodies we don't normally actually see them bonded ionically or else we essentially appear to just dissolve or dissociate into the water and, and not exist anymore and that's not good so this is where you're going to actually have a trading of electrons this is where you're going to have a loss or a gain so one guy is going to give up electrons and become positive because it gave up a negative charge somebody else is going to gain that negative charge and so they will become negative overall and it's that negative positive interaction that makes them stick together right opposites attract so sodium which is now sodium one plus sodium ion is now attracted to the chloride because the chloride has a negative charge so they stick together that's how ionic bonds work so sodium's happy chlorine's happy everybody likes this this normally occurs where the positive guy will be a metal that usually has one or two electrons that it needs to get rid of and then on the other side you normally have a non-metal and so that's the one that almost has a full set like it's it has six or seven electrons and so ultimately it wants to go through and just get those couple extra which it can steal from the metal that needs to get rid of some now this is going to occur because there's a large electronegativity gap as well if you see electronegativity it's just how badly you want to grab hold of electrons and so these nonmetals over here have a very high electronegativity I'll just write EN for electronegativity whereas the metals over here they have a very low electronegativity they don't really want electrons that badly they're more than gladly willing to give them up so it's kind of like a tug of war where you've got like a little child on one side and a big old bodybuilder on the other and so it essentially can just rip the electron rate from it now with covalent chemical bonds this is where they're not trying to steal electrons because there isn't enough of a difference in electronegativity to allow them to kind of rip the electron away from the other guy and so what they do instead is they line themselves up so the orbitals which contain their electrons that's like a region where the electrons are typically they overlap and so both of them can kind of detect the electrons there so I donate one electron that's in this orbital you donate the other so now because our orbitals overlap we both kind of detect two electrons there so we're both happy now we don't each have two electrons I didn't get an electron from somebody we're just sharing them it's kind of like us both putting a dollar on the table and both thinking we have two dollars now because we can both detect the two dollars but in reality we each still only put in a dollar if I take both you'd have none and I'm not strong enough there's not a big enough electronegativity gap to let me take all of it so therefore we just share and we both are happy because we both think that we're good so this is energetically stable by just overlapping these orbitals this is the type of bond that we will almost always talk about biologically because we're going to deal with mostly molecules and molecules are by definition covalently bound so all organic chemistry the chemistry of life is going to revolve around these covalent bonds and the number of valence electrons that you're short so let's say you've got six you want eight so ultimately you'll form two bonds to get you to eight if you've got something like carbon that has four valence electron it's going to typically want to form four bonds so it can get to eight valence electrons you know something like nitrogen has five valence so it wants three so it typically forms three bonds to get to that stable octet that stable eight electrons in the valence shell now polarity is an interesting concept this is where there's an imbalance in electronegativity and so it's kind of like a tug of war where I'm a little bit stronger or if you for your own ego want to think I'm the one that's a bit weaker that's fine and so we're in this tug of war and you're winning a bit but you can't completely win or it's like arm wrestling where you know you've got the person down close but you can't touch their knuckles to the table you can't win but you're obviously winning you know you obviously are doing better than the other person that's kind of this idea of polarity so one of them is more electronegative and so it's able to pull things a little bit closer to it it's able to get the electrons a little bit closer to it than the other guy so it becomes partially negative that's what this symbol here means this refers to partial we say partial charge so fluorine has the electrons a little bit closer to it so I'll kind of draw it that way so the electrons are a bit closer to it so it's a little bit negative and carbon because the electrons are a bit further away from it is going to be partially positive this can be important because they can interact with stuff like ions that are fully charged 
because they have this partial charge. So it's a weaker interaction, but it's still there. It's like a magnet that's really weak, that's still you know a bit magnetic, but it's just not as strong as your typical magnet. It's not as strong as what you would get from something that's an ion. That's how polarity works. And you can have polar bonds like this one is, where ultimately you know one guy is just winning in this fight for the electrons. You can also have polar molecules where one side of the molecule, also in this case, one whole side of the molecule is essentially one charge and the other side of the molecule is a different charge. This will be important when we talk about things like water because water is a polar molecule where the hydrogens, so this whole side here will be slightly positive and the oxygen will be slightly negative. And so that's both polar bonds as well as a polar molecule, this imbalance. Now with nonpolar covalent bonds, so the opposite of having a polar bond, the opposite of, of having polarity, what happens here is you have where there's almost identical electronegativities. So this is like a tug of war where no one's really winning. And so this occurs for the most part between carbon and hydrogen. So this is common in organic chemistry, uh, the stuff that we're made of. It also occurs where you have two guys that are identical. So a hydrogen bonded to another hydrogen, you know, an oxygen bonded to another oxygen. Whenever you have these situations, they're sharing the electrons completely evenly. So it's a nonpolar bond. This becomes significant biologically because polar things don't like to mix well with nonpolar things. So this will explain certain concepts like why oils don't mix in water. Water's polar, oils are not, they're nonpolar. Hence, they don't get along very well. That partial charge doesn't like the absence of charge. Those two don't mix. Now, attractive forces are going to be forces between separate molecules that are not bonds. They're not as strong as bonds. These things are typically anywhere from, let's say, 5 or 10% as strong as a covalent bond to maybe even less than 1% as strong. So they're much, much, much weaker. But they are important because they do allow separate molecules. So in this case, we've got one covalently bound water. This is very strong. And we've got these weaker attractive forces holding them together. And that matters. I mean, that, that force can be significant to try to keep things in specific arrangements, to try to allow separate objects, separate molecules to still stick closer together than they would elsewise. And so molecules that have these partial charges we talked about, so things that are polar, they tend to have a type of interaction that's called hydrogen bonding at its strongest. You might also see dipole-dipole thrown around. That's just the weaker version of it. I'm just gonna kind of lump it in as hydrogen bonding for here. Uh, but this is where you have that there's this positive region, semi-positive, and there's this partial negative region. And the partially negative region attracts separate partially positive regions. So the hydrogen on one water molecule would be attracted to the oxygen of a separate water molecule because it's slightly positive, that's slightly negative, opposites attract. Now with Van der Waals forces, these occur for everyone. This is where you ultimately have um, that a molecule has its electrons constantly moving and sometimes those electrons happen to be mostly on one side of the molecule and so that side of the molecule becomes slightly negative just for like a, a moment a fraction of a second and the other side becomes slightly positive and so that can then get these temporary attractive forces between the different molecules but these are temporary you know when you talk about hydrogen bonds when you talk about these polar molecules this is something that's fairly permanent the bonds themselves, these attractive forces, the hydrogen bonds, the dipole-dipole interactions, they can form and break, but that charge, that partial charge that's present sticks around. Whereas with Van der Waals, these are a temporary partial charge. So these are very, very temporary attractive.